queens of the world. Granya Nemali, Grace O'Malley, Irish Pirate Queen. Granya Nemali, known as Grace O'Malley in English, was raised aboard her father's ship. Her charisma then won her the loyalty of her husband's men. Together, they traded and marauded the rough west coast of Ireland. She feuded with other clans until the English came to take over the nation. Grania and her English nemesis nearly destroyed each other until she went over his head and met directly with Queen Elizabeth I to get a royally sanctioned piracy license. Grania was born around 1530 on Clare Island. Her name was Grania ni Mali. In Irish mythology, Grania is a princess who elopes with a young lover to escape being married to an older man. In the Gaelic language, Ni before a clan name indicates daughter of, while O indicates grandson of. The anglicized version of her name, Grace O'Malley, was not used until years after her death, so we will call her Grania. Her father, Owen O'Malley, was the chief of Clan O'Malley, based in Clue Bay, County Mayo. The O'Malleys were one of only a handful of seafaring clans. Their territory was abundant in natural resources. Their pastures supported large herds of cattle. Their forests were rich in timber, ideal for shipbuilding, and their waters were well stocked. The O'Malleys built a row of castles facing the sea and controlled the treacherous waters around County Mayo. They fished, charged others for safe passage, and occasionally outright boarded and looted vessels. Their family motto was Terra Marique Putens, powerful on land and sea. The clan was so notorious among their Irish neighbors that the major trade port of Galway refused to do business with them. So they sailed their seafood and other wares to France, Spain, and England, where they fetched an even higher price. Grania's father was a very wealthy man. Her mother, Maeve, also came to the Union with a good deal of wealth. Grania was their only child. From an early age, she was eager to ship out to sea, which was not considered a proper place for a girl. She badgered her father endlessly about allowing her aboard. Two legends explain how young Grania finally got her wish. The first is that she stowed away below decks and waited until her father's galley had sailed too far to return home. She then revealed herself and Owen and his crew were so charmed that he allowed her to stay. The other yarn is that her father once told her she couldn't possibly be aboard a ship because her long red hair would get tangled in the rigging. In response, Grania took a knife and cut off all her hair. Her father couldn't argue with that, and he took her with him on a trading expedition to Spain. From then on, she was called Grania Whale, or Grania the Bald. Whichever the story, she was allowed to take up a seafaring life, rather than follow the traditional route of education for a chief's child, being fostered out to the family of another chief. Scrappy Grania spent her youth aboard her father's ships, learning to sail, fish, fight, navigate, and memorizing the treacherous waters her people called home. She did receive some formal education in reading, writing, and Latin, likely from the monks at a nearby monastery patronized by the O'Malley's. She also picked up several foreign languages during her travels. According to one story, her father taught her that if their ship was ever under attack, she was to go below deck and hide. On one occasion, the ship was invaded by English pirates. Grania tried to follow her father's instructions, but found the way below blocked. So instead, she decided to climb up the rigging to get out of harm's way. From above, she had an excellent view of the battle. She watched as her father dueled an enemy. Owen killed the other man, but staggered away wounded. 
Grania saw that another enemy pirate was sneaking up on her father from behind with his cutlass drawn. Grania jumped down from the rigging onto the Englishman and with her own small knife, dispatched him to Davy Jones' locker, saving her father's life. By 16, she had thoroughly earned the hard-won respect of her father's crew, but at this age, she was forced to fulfill her duty as the daughter of the chief and wed a fellow nobleman. She married Donal, heir to the chief of Clan O'Flaherty. They were also a seafaring clan, but Grania was expected to stay at home with the other women and was forced to give up the sea. She fulfilled her duty by bearing three children, two sons, Owen and Moreau, and a daughter, Maeve. Her husband was a rake and a bully. He had a raging temper and terrorized his neighbors in frequent disputes over boundaries and property. He was nicknamed the Cock. As he was often away from home causing mischief, Grania took the opportunity to seize command of his ships. She was shrewd, charismatic, and knew her stuff, and she earned the respect of the O'Flaherty men. Soon, Grania was back at the helm of a ship, marauding the coast just as she had always wanted. She sent her sons, Owen and Moreau, to be fostered by other clan chiefs, but kept her daughter, Maeve, by her side. Grania and her crew targeted merchant ships heading to and from the trade city of Galway, which had long refused to do business with her father. Galway complained of their molestation to the English. For much of the Middle Ages, Ireland was seen by the rest of Europe as a possession of the Catholic Church, granted as a fiefdom to the King of England. Anglo-Irish lords held territory in the east of Ireland. They paid tribute to the English and waged war on the native clans to the west. But after Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and Marianne Boleyn, he asserted his own authority over his western neighbors. Henry declared himself King of Ireland in 1541. He installed an English Lord Deputy to take control of the island and began the slow, bloody process of replacing ancient clan and tribal law with the Irish House of Lords. Donald O'Flaherty was in a dispute with rival clan Joyce over the strategic fortress known as Cox Castle. While he was out hunting, he was ambushed by Joyce men and murdered. Expecting no resistance, the Joyces headed to Cox Castle. But to their surprise, Donald's widow, Grania, was there with her men. The Joyces laid siege to the castle. Grania ordered her crew to remove all the lead from the roof, melt it down, and pour it onto the heads of the soldiers below. She then lit a fire beacon to call reinforcements from the coast to finish off the few survivors. Since that day, Cox Castle has been known as Hens Castle. When Grania returned to the O'Flaherty stronghold, she found that her place had been stolen from under her. In retribution for her attacks on Galway ships, the new English monarch, Henry's daughter, Elizabeth I, had appointed a minor O'Flaherty cousin to lead the clan, disinheriting her sons. Unlike English primogeniture, where the eldest son always inherits his father's titles, Irish chiefs were elected. They often still passed down family lines, and Grania had expected the title to go to one of her sons. But the English swooped in and used the Irish system to get a man loyal to them elected chief. Grania returned to her birthplace, Clare Island. She had won the loyalty of many O'Flaherty men, and they followed her there. Her reputation traveled far, and soon men with a taste for sea life came from many surrounding clans to swear loyalty to the pirate queen. Grania was an inspiring and just leader. She said she would rather have a ship full of Conroys and McNallys than a ship full of gold. 
she and her crew had great success in both legitimate trade and illegal piracy, and amassed a great deal of wealth. Grania's preferred method of fighting was with a sword in each hand. One day while on the way to church, she was informed that an English ship had wrecked off the rocks just off the coast of the island. Unable to resist, she abandoned her route to church, rounded up a few men, and set out to salvage what they could from the wreckage. In addition to booty, she discovered a survivor, a handsome English sailor named Hugh de Lacey. He and Grania became lovers, and she may have had an illegitimate child by him. In the midst of the affair, Hugh went out hunting and was murdered by Clan McMahon. Grania sought revenge. She ambushed the murderers, killed them, and stole their ships and their castle, Duna. She thus earned the nickname the Dark Lady of Duna. According to legend, when Grania and her men stopped near Dublin to take on supplies, she went on land to pay a friendly visit to Baron Hoth, a lord backed by the English. According to Irish custom, when a chieftain pays a peaceful call on another, they must offer hospitality. Instead, Grania was informed that the Baron was at dinner and was sent away. She was deeply insulted. On her way home, she ran in to the Baron's grandson. She kidnapped the boy and took him back to her ship. Baron Hoth was horrified. He followed the pirate queen and offered her a chest of gold for his grandson's safe return. Grania replied that she didn't want riches. She wanted the Baron to treat his guests with hospitality and respect. She returned his grandson to him unscathed. To this day, Hoth Castle keeps the old gates unlocked and sets an extra place for a guest at the dining table. At 36, Grania married for a second time to Iron Richard, heir to the chief of Clan Burke. She found his strategic mainland fortress, Rockfleet Castle, more attractive than the man himself. During their honeymoon, she installed her own men in his castle and her own ships in the bay. Richard left his bride to do some business with a neighboring clan. Upon his return, he found the gates of his own castle locked and Grania's men guarding them. She is said to have yelled down from a window, I divorce you, Iron Richard. This, according to Irish law, dissolved their marriage, but she kept the castle. Grania lived off and on at Rockfleet Castle for the rest of her life. In order to reach her bedchamber at the top of the tower, one had to use a narrow spiral staircase. Any attacker trying to come up the stairway would be forced to hold their sword in their left hand. While anyone going down, say Grania or her guards, would have the room to use their right hand and likely win the duel. In her bedroom was a narrow window through which she draped a long rope. One end was tied to her bedpost and the other to her favorite galley in the harbor below. That way, if anyone tried to steal her ship in the night, Grania would know about it. Grania and Iron Richard remained married under English law, and they did maintain a loose, mutually beneficial partnership for the rest of his life. Though he was gone from her bed, he had left something behind. Grania was pregnant. She gave birth below deck during a pitched battle with Algerian pirates. Within hours of giving birth to her son, Tibbet, she got up, got dressed, and joined her men to fight off the attackers. Ireland had a new English Lord Deputy, Sir Henry Sidney. He was putting pressure on Irish lords to swear fealty to Elizabeth I in exchange for an English barony and a seat in the Irish House of Lords. Grania and Iron Richard took every opportunity to resist and undermine the English in their part of the country. An English sheriff attacked her castle at Clare Island. Grania beat him back and he barely escaped alive. 
Rather than try and fight the Pirate Queen with steel, Sir Sidney turned to politics. He had Iron Richard voted out as chief of Clan Burke. Grania was furious to see another of her sons disinherited by the English. She met with Sir Sidney and offered him the services of three galleys and 200 fighting men, if he would restore her family's titles and land. He was charmed by her and wrote back to England, calling her a most feminine sea captain and the most notorious woman on all the coast of Ireland. But before they could make a deal, Grania, while out marauding, was captured by her intended victim and hauled into a Dublin prison. She was held there for two years. But while most Irish pirates were publicly executed, Grania was offered her freedom if she would swear to end her piracy. Once freed, she set sail immediately to resume her life of crime. The replacement head of Clan Burke died, and the English backed his son as their next chief. But Richard and Grania decided to fight for it. After a drawn-out battle, the English decided to cut a deal with Richard. They would allow him to be elected chief and grant him an English title if he would bend the knee to Queen Elizabeth. He agreed. Grania was thus titled Lady Burke, but in dispatches back to London, Richard was referred to as the husband of Grania O'Malley. Richard died of natural causes, and according to Irish law, Grania was entitled to one-third of his wealth. She had little faith that the English would allow her her due, so she seized it before it could be taken from her. The wealthy 53-year-old widow continued her career of piracy, or as she called it, maintenance by land and sea. But Queen Elizabeth was determined to finally put an end to her Gaelic buccaneer counterpart. She dispatched Sir Richard Bingham to bring Grania to justice. His philosophy was that the Irish would never respond to words, but they would respond to the sword. He began his assault by kidnapping her two younger sons, Moreau and Tibbet, and holding them hostage. Next, he went to the castle of her eldest son, Owen. Unaware that his brothers had been kidnapped, Owen followed the rules of Irish hospitality and fed and sheltered Bingham and his men. In the middle of the night, Bingham's men seized Owen and accused him of aiding and abetting rebels against the crown. While Owen was tied up, he was stabbed 12 times. The English excused the murder as a foiled escape attempt and took over Owen's castle. Grania was furious. She hired mercenaries from Scotland to help her rescue her surviving sons and seek revenge on Bingham. But before her vendetta could be fulfilled, she was captured by the English. She was found guilty of treason. Hiring Scottish mercenaries was particularly offensive to the English and sentenced to death. But as her gallows were being constructed, her son-in-law, Maeve's husband, Richard the Devilhook, Burke, came to her rescue. He was a cousin of Grania's second husband and had succeeded him as chief of Clan Burke. He and Maeve had a very close relationship and many children. More than once, he saved her from death. Richard negotiated with the English that if he was given possession of his mother-in-law, he would keep her under control. Once they were out the door, Grania went straight back out to sea. Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth's longtime enemy, Philip II of Spain, had sent his mighty armada to attack London and take the English throne by force. The Spanish Armada was twice the size of the English, but their ships were large and slow, while Elizabeth's were small and fast. The English attack caused chaos and the Spanish ships fled. Bad weather moved in to blow the Armada away, spelling victory for Queen Elizabeth. 26 unfortunate Spanish ships wrecked on the Irish coast, and they were preyed upon by marauders. The English ordered any Spanish survivors to be put to death, 
But it was whispered that Grania rescued the crew of at least one Spanish vessel and helped them escape to safety. When Sir Bingham returned to Ireland, he was furious that Grania had slipped through his fingers. He still had both of her sons in prison, so he turned her second son, Moreau, against her. This wasn't hard to do. He had taken after his father and was a violent man. While growing up, Moreau often beat his younger sister and refused to listen to his mother because she was a woman. Grania never spoke to her son again, but often insulted him. She marched to his castle and leveled it, shocking the English. In retaliation, Bingham destroyed her fleet and prepared to execute her still loyal son, Tibbet. Grania had had enough of the back and forth. She went over Bingham's head and wrote directly to Queen Elizabeth. She pled the tragedies perpetrated upon her family and offered her piracy services directly to the English crown, providing Her Majesty remove Bingham from working against her. Elizabeth was intrigued. She already had pirates Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake in her employ, and so the English Virgin Queen invited the Irish Pirate Queen to meet her in person at Greenwich Palace. Grania cleaned herself up and wore a fine gown to the interview. Before entering the presence chamber, she was searched and a dagger was found concealed in her gown. English courtiers were terrified for their queen's safety, but Grania said it was for her own protection, and Elizabeth let it slide. Grania refused to bow before Elizabeth, insisting that they were both queens on equal footing. At one point, Grania sneezed and was given a lace-edged handkerchief from a noblewoman. She blew her nose into it and then threw it into the fireplace, shocking the court. Grania remarked that in Ireland, a used handkerchief was considered dirty and was properly destroyed. The two queens probably conversed in Latin, their common language. Elizabeth was fascinated by Grania. She was only three years older, 60 and 63, but Grania had lived a full, free, and fearless life in a way Elizabeth had never been able to. She also related to the difficulties of being a female leader in a male world. She granted Grania's request to free her son Tibbet and restore his land, and to allow Grania to continue her piracy under the seal of the English crown. She declined to remove Bingham, but the queen wrote a letter restraining him from bothering Grania, which she had the satisfaction of handing him personally. Grania returned to the sea with three new galleys and 300 men. Though his hands were tied, Bingham continued to spy on her and generally be a thorn in her side. He ordered Grania to quarter a bankrupting number of English soldiers on her land. She complained again to Elizabeth, and Bingham was finally fully removed from office. He continued to fight the Irish and died in battle a few years later. Grania continued her piracy until the age of 70. She died in 1603, the same year as Elizabeth, and was buried on Clare Island, the place of her birth. Her son, Tibbet, became a power player in Irish politics and was created the first Viscount Mayo. Though Grania was not exactly a role model, she holds a fascinating place in history and legend. So, this St. Patrick's Day, raise a class to Grania O'Malley, the Irish Pirate Queen. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.